By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a top 8 match for you from the Knights of Thorn, the old school championship in the Netherlands. And this time we have Antoine, a player from Belgium for you on the left. He's playing with the deck and he's playing against Jimmy who's playing with Svantok. And before we start with the match, I would like to give you some brief information about this deck, Svantok, because it's pretty new and um, it's interesting. So here we go. So Svantok is named after two things, Svante Landgraf from Sweden, a magic player, very good one, and Atok, the red creature that you're probably familiar with for one red and one, it's a one, two creature. And if you sacrifice an artifact, it gets plus two, plus two. Now, um, Svante was going to uh, participate in NoobCon 2019, and he thought, okay, I like the ATOC deck, but I want to make the perfect ATOC deck. I want to make it better. Now it's just, you know, aggressive, sack some artifacts, but I think I can optimize it. So what he did, he asked two very good um, old school players, Brian Manalakis and Will Maygram, to help him to build the ultimate ATOC deck. And when I'm looking at the list, and I will actually uh, post a link in the comments to uh, a deck picture and actually a full tournament report that Svante Landgraf uh, wrote about his NoobCon 2019 uh, experience, and he actually reached the finals. So it's quite a nice read to see like what decks he played and how it performed. Um, but what he did when I'm looking at the list and I'm comparing it to the traditional ATOC list, one of the first things that I noticed is that there's no copper tablet in there. And copper tablet is one of my personal favorites. It's two mana and it's just guaranteed damage, but it's not in here. Instead, it looks like he has chosen for a full play set of Ankh of Mishra's. Now Ankh of Mishra says, whenever you put a land in play, any of the players, you, you get two damage. Now, when I'm looking at the list, I also see a play set of Shatters. And I think there's a connection between these two. Because in old school, you often have to deal with Mana Rocks. You have the Moxen, you have Felwer Stone, you have Sol Ring, you know, you have all sorts of ways. Of course, you also have a Mishra's Factory that can turn into an artifact creature. And Shatter kind of takes care of all of this. So, if you don't allow your opponent to gain any mana from Mana Rocks, it means they have to play out land. And then it's great when you have an Ankh of Mishra in play because that's going to take two damage. He also plays with Black Vice, which is not that new. You see that in many ATOC builds. Uh, it's a play set of Black Vice, but it's in there for a reason, obviously. Black Vice and Ankh of Mishra have great synergy because when you're playing against this and these two cards are on the table, you want to play out land because you want to empty your hand to deactivate the Black Vice. But if you start playing land, you get damage from the Ankh of Mishra. So whether you choose the A route or the B route, you're going to get damage. So I think that's great. Another thing that I notice about this list is that he has four lightning bolts, only three chain lightning, so not a full playset. And this is where it gets interesting. He plays with, with three side blasts. So that's a direct damage card from blue. And the interesting thing is they can do four damage to your opponent in one go. So that means with those three blasts, he actually has 12 damage. And then if you add up the lightning bolts and the chain lightning, you actually uh, get to 33 damage, so 33 direct damage. And then you haven't done a single damage with your Black Vice, with your Ankh of Mishra, and we haven't even talked about the playset of Atox, because there's also a playset of Atox in here. But actually, when I'm looking at this list, they're not even that interesting. Obviously, they're great for a swing. He also plays with two city and a Balos, so that's a total of 10 artifacts. And then he also has Moxen, Soul Ring, and Black Lotus, so Moxen are great to, to feed to your Atok. Um, he, he plays all five of them. He plays the Black Lotus and the Soul Rings. So that's uh, seven uh, mana artifacts, you could say. So seven and 10, 17 artifacts plus a Chaos Orb. But I doubt if he'll often sack the Chaos Orb to Atok. On the other hand, if you can win, of course he's going to do that. So that's even an extra artifact. So he definitely has the artifacts to back up a full play set of Atok and Atok is still this great creature because you attack and your opponent is like, yeah, okay, if I let it go, I have to calculate how many artifacts order on the field, how much um, life do I still have, and also keep in the back of his head that this deck, this ATOC deck, has 33 direct damage in there. So you cannot take too much damage um, from the ATOC, actually. And also, I'm, I'm completely forgetting a full play set of Mishra's Factories that you can also sack to the ATOC 
if you want to. Now, another thing that um, kind of stands out in this list is the balance. So interesting here because uh, balance doesn't take artifacts in. Uh, into account so it works great with artifacts and actually enchantment spells because it doesn't take that in so you can empty your hand with your cheap artifact spells and then play your balance and it's basically an extra mind twist also um, he's very light on creatures with this deck so if for any reason kind of the game moves on to mid game late game where usually you know you're probably going to lose because you're playing with an aggressive deck Balance is one of those cards that can get you back into the game. Now, obviously, he plays with uh, Mind Twist and Demonic Tutor, just splashing them in here, playing with three City of Brasses and all the necessary dual lands to kind of sort that out. I think in, in this deck, actually, the two cards that are the strongest, when I'm looking at the list, eh, so I haven't actually seen the deck in action, um, the, the cards that really stand out for me is Time Twister, and a Wheel of Fortune. And the reason for that is quite simple. You're playing aggressive with lots of cheap spells, so that means that you're going to empty your hand very quickly. So one of the most important things with decks like this is to keep refueling your hand. Now, Time Twister is brutal, because if you've played, let's say you've played two Lightning Bolts and two Shatters, and um, there are like four lands in your um, on your side of the table. When you're playing a Time Twister, you're getting all that direct damage shuffled back into your deck, but what's on the table, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't put back in the deck, obviously. So those lands are kind of filtered out. So the chances of you getting more direct damage, I mean, th that's increased. And also, the synergy between a Time Twister and also Wheel of Fortune with a Black Vise, I mean, that's a classic combination. I was doing that back in, in 94, and I'm sure you were too, where you were just playing... Uh, a Wheel of Fortune followed up by, by a Black Vice, or even better, if you already had a Black Vice there on the field, you played your uh, Wheel of Fortune and you would draw into another Black Vice, playing your second Black Vice, and your opponent kind of had a guaranteed uh, six damage there next turn that he could hardly do anything against. So looking at this list, um, it's very aggressive, and I'm really curious um, if the deck can actually perform against this, because it's it's so aggressive. So I'm really looking forward to um, game number one and to see this this deck, Svantok, that uh, Brian Manalakas, Will Magren, and Svante Landgra Landgraf uh, actually created. So if you'd like to know more about this deck after this episode, please check the comments below where I'll, I'll have a link to the full tournament report written down by Svante Landgraf of NoobCon 2019. And then you can actually uh, see the deck picture for yourself and you can kind of get to know this deck better. But for now, we are going on to game number one. Game number one is about to start and look at those beautiful playmats. We have Antoine, the player with the deck, playing on the left with the Chaos Orb playmat. And we have Jimmy Toad, the player who plays with the Svantok deck, the deck that we just discussed, playing with the All Hallows Eve playmat. Pretty cool, guys. And um, I believe it's the Svantok uh, player, so Jimmy on the play here. And there's a, uh, <laughs> a hello there. <laughs> Hi, Antoine. Uh, a hello from Antoine, the player from Belgium. And I, I did see Jimmy there putting a card on the bottom. We're doing London Mulligan rule here at the Knights of uh, Thorn. So he probably took a mulligan here, um, taking a damage and playing a black vice. So that's a nice start here for the ATOC deck. You want to be aggressive. That's exactly what he's doing. And there's a City of Brass and a pass turn. And look at that. Ankh of Mishra taking another damage here, playing an ATOC. So this is a great start. And there's a quick Swords to Plows here on that ATOC. So that means some damage here for Antoine, taking two damage from the Ankh and damage here from the uh, from the Black Vice. Okay, and you see them here changing their life totals on the dice as well. That's nice, and we can follow the totals also. So thank you for doing that. And there's a Demonic Tutor. And I have this feeling that this is going to be a close match. At the moment, it looks like the, the Svantok deck is just you know, way, way too aggressive all over the place and really taking care of uh, the deck. But we'll see. And this is great, actually. A Divine Offering here. Probably taking care of the Black Vice. Exactly. And uh, that's great. 
And there are seven new cards here. And this is that Wheel of Fortune and that Time Twister that I talked about that I think are very, very powerful in this build. And of course, a Demonic Tutor is basically a plus one of any card. And there is a Time Walk. And I think that's necessary because then you can untap with the full hand. And with so many cheap spells, I'm sure Jimmy is able now to put some extra pressure on the board. Maybe play out a new vice. Let's see what's going to happen. Of course, he needs some time to think, has a handful of spells here, plays an underground sea, taking two damage from his own Ankh of Mishra. And what are we going, going to see here? It's a mind twist. Oh, brutal. Brutal, brutal, brutal. So, so far it looks like, oh, and he, he's losing Demonic Tutor, ouch. So, so far it looks like that uh, the Sventog player has control here of the game. But on the other hand, um, Antoine is only on 13, or is still on 13. So, I mean, there are still options here. He still has some cards in hand. And I wonder what's going to happen. And he's just passing turn here. And basically what the, um, the Svantog deck now really wants, I think, is just direct damage. Just direct damage. Or an ATOC or something. But just, you know, something to do to do some damage here. Because that is the downside of the Ankh. It does give your opponent an option. So your opponent can choose, do I want to take two damage or not? Now, whenever you give an opponent an option, it's, it's always less powerful. And here's a city in a bottle. So taking care of that city of brass. And here we go. There's a Time Twister. And there's a Disenchant. He was actually tapping that City of Brass for a mana when the City of the Bo when City of a Bottle came in play. Used it for a Disenchant, taking care of that Ankh of Mishra. And again, you know, we've we've seen the Wheel of Fortune and we've seen the, the Time Twister. And like I said in the introduction, I think these are going to be really key cards in this uh, Swantok build. And it's going to be interesting here to see what he's going to draw. And you, you basically see like how little the deck player got actually the opportunity, this game at least, to do anything. And playing out a Mishra's Factory here. Probably going to pass turn. And we see a couple of mocks in here hitting the table. Mox Ruby is one of them. And an attack here with Mishra's Factory. So actually the first combat damage of the game. Does mean that he's open, but that white mana is open as well. So I believe that if he's going to attack, and that's nice. There's a chain lightning, so three to the face. I wanted to say I'm pretty sure if he's going to attack with the Mishra's Factory, he's probably going to get some damage in. And there's a side blast. It went really quickly, but there's a side blast. And this is this 33 direct damage power that's in this Svantog deck. I mean, this is just crazy. And it's not 10 against 5. And interesting to see here is that the deck player, actually, uh, Antoine, he cannot counter. He doesn't have any blue mana. And that's a rare sight to see when you see a, a, the deck player without blue mana. It's usually, uh, it's usually not a good thing for the deck player and a good thing if you're playing against the deck player. And it looks like he attacked, actually, with the Mishra's Factory. Um, so that life total should go down there from 10 to 8. And the Svantok player, it's, it's, I cannot see his hand, unfortunately, but it looks like he's he's out of gas at the moment. And that gives opportunity here to the deck player to like slowly get back into the game. Um, when you're playing the, the deck, the... Ooh, and there's a Shatter. I had the play set of Shatters that we talked about. And what I wanted to say is when you're playing the deck... City in a bottle is, is, is not a huge problem. It's not great, but it's it's not huge. You just have your City of Brass and your Library of Alexandria basically doing nothing. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's not really a big issue. And attacking here, but there's a disenchant. And then you kind of see, like, how many weapons there actually are against the Mishra's Factories. Because as soon as it becomes an artifact land creature, I always feel like it's kind of asking, kill me, kill me now. And here's a Black Vice from the Svantok player, uh, for, sorry, from the Svantok deck. Uh, and there's a balance, interesting choice here. So that's gonna cost him a lot of lands. 
and probably some cards. It's a bit annoying that we cannot see the cards in hand, especially when one of them is playing with Black Vices. But he's losing three land here. And actually, Antoine has to discard a card, so that kind of tells us a little bit about his hand size. So both players must have like three cards in hand. They're interesting here. We see Jimmy trying to play out a City of Brass. It's not possible because of that city in a bottle that's there. So it's kind of blocking his own land here. And there's a Chaos Arp hitting the table. Interesting, interesting. Very interesting first game. I'm really enjoying the magic here. A lot of things happening here between the players. And there's that activation and the factory is swinging in for another two damage. And it's going to be interesting here to see what the Svantok player is going to do. Now remember he's at eight, actually not at 10. And there's a Swords to Plows here, so that means he is going to 10. And he also activates his Chaos Orb in response. So he's actually not pumping it, but he's activating the Chaos Orb. And as you can see, I've put it here in slow motion, and he's choosing the Tundra, so he doesn't want his opponent to get any blue mana. And I think that's a good decision, because blue power can really uh, change a game and can get somebody back. And there's a Psy Blast, and... Ooh, there's a Swords! Okay, so that's nice. That means he's on one life. I wanted to say that's game, but there was that Swords to Plows here. It's, and that means he's still on one life, but there's the Bolt, and, and that's it. You kind of know when your opponent is playing... 33, dam uh, uh, 33 points of direct damage in his deck that when you're on when you're on three life you're probably not going to make it so first game here for the Svantok deck and uh, the players are now going to sideboard and uh, we'll see them when we start with game number two game number two and let's see so it's the deck player on play here and that was a really really entertaining first game so a lot of interaction that's kind of what you want want to see and there we see a mulligan taken by the Svantok player and remember we're doing a London mulligan here so that means that when you take a mulligan you get to draw seven cards and then you pick one of them and put them at the bottom of your library if you uh, do an, take another mulligan you take seven again but then you put two down uh, at the bottom of your library and here we see Jimmy putting a card down and he actually mulligan i believe in the first game as well so he's not very lucky when it comes to getting a good opening hand i, I guess um and there we see a lot of moxen and we see the abyss hitting the table interesting choice to sideboard since the atog deck only plays with four actual creatures that can get targeted by the abyss and that's for atog then again um your opponent is not really able to get rid of enchantments, so it's probably gonna stick this abyss. So here we see Antoine taking two damage from the cities and playing a Brain Geyser here, drawing three cards, so that's great for him. And that, that must be nice as well, knowing that you're playing against an opponent that doesn't uh, play with any counter spells. Because the, the deck, the Svantok deck, like many aggro decks, are really just looking to attack, 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 attack. And a, and a counter spell is more a reactive spell where you want to be proactive as an aggressor. And so here we see an Ancestral Recall. So maybe that can kind of change the situation here for Jimmy. And there's a Chain Lightning to the face. And he has so much direct damage, like I said before. So actually just playing it very aggressively to the face early in the game is fine you don't have to wait till he is on nine or something you can just start throwing the spells as soon as you draw them and when you're playing against a deck which is creature light you don't have to kind of keep them for instance for a hypnotic specter or something you don't have to worry about that in this uh, matchup there's a soul ring here from Antoine and there's a tap here city of brass and a plains And unfortunately, I couldn't really see what he was playing. That's pretty annoying. Like, it could have been a regrowth there, but I couldn't see it. And there's another Chain Lightning. So despite the fact that the uh, that Jimmy is not doing a lot, he can still just deal some direct damage. There's no Counterspell here from Antoine. And you can see him going to 8. 
So does that mean that the Swan Dog deck is going to win this one? Because it's looking good again. And there's five, another Brain Geyser. Okay, so he played a Regrowth over the Brain Geyser earlier in the game. Drawing even more cards. And this, I think this is this is a good card here, this Ivory Tower. I'm not sure if he boarded it in from the sideboard or if it's part of his main deck. And actually he's now on five life. Unfortunately, we cannot see that last uh, dice there, but I can tell you he's on five life. Very exciting here. And there's a Wheel of Fortune. And this works kind of both ways, because on one hand, um, you're not happy when you're Antoine, but on the other hand, you're drawing seven, so your Ivory Tower gets activated. Um, but you also know that all that your opponent needs is two direct damage spells. Or just, you know, Black Vice would help here as well, canceling out the um, Ivory Tower. Playing Mishra's Factory for now, passing turn. And it's going to be difficult for Antoine to play out anything. Okay, here we see his life totals. He's actually not on five, he's actually on eight life. So that gives him some more space, at least. And here you're kind of seeing um, the Abyss not really being able to do anything against that um, Mishra's Factory. And here's a Gloom kind of blocking those um, Disenchants and uh, Sword to Plows here. So now, Antoine is taking time to kind of count his mana here, seeing, okay, what can I play out? And as you can see, he has quite a lot, so I don't think the Gloom is really going to hurt too much. And he's killing, playing his swords here on the factory, and in response, obviously, Jimmy is pumping the factory, pumping the factory itself to 3-3 three, three, and pumping it with the other factory to 4-4, four, four, gaining 4 life, go, getting back to 20. And here we see the Ivory Tower actually doing work. So he's going back to 10 again. And this is quite frustrating um, when you're the aggressor. I mean, to kind of see your burn spells, um, you know, not really being able to do their work because your opponent is having that ivory tower. I think Jimmy really needs a black vice here to kind of get control back here in the game. And here you kind of see what can happen when you're drawing the Ankh of Mishras, but you don't have the artifact removal to kind of remove the the soul ring and the mox and, and, and whatnot. I'm, I'm actually surprised that he's countering the Ankh of Mishra here because he seems to be doing fine with those two Ankhs there. And he's not using the extra mana and there's another attack here from the Mishras factory. So he's going to eight. Getting three life again, so going back to 11, so it's actually gaining, and there's a Library of Alexandria. Oh, wow. And that means that he can start drawing even more cards. I really like the synergy between Library of Alexandria and Ivory Tower. I'm actually a, a bigger fan. There's a Disenchant on the Mishra's Factory, by the way. I'm actually an even bigger fan of the synergy between Simbat and Ivory Tower. Because it's just a little bit more clunky. But looking back at the game, there's a lot happening. And it's just so hard to kill um, the deck, you know, um, play, skilled players that play with the deck. Because there's just there's so many outs. And here we see, ooh, this is interesting. So probably you boarded in Surrender Afrits from the sideboard. And, and to play more aggressively. And now he's playing an Atok and a Surrender Perfreed. So maybe that's why Antoine has decided to play the Abyss because he kind of um, expected Jimmy to board in those Surrender Perfreeds against him. So that's some high level play. And that's some kind of like that sideboard psychology. Like if I board this and he's going to board that and I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. Um, so far it's really working out for Antoine. He's back on 15. So remember, at a certain point in this game, he was on 5 life, and now he's back on 15. And I must say, it's looking good for Antoine, and, and that's game, actually. Jimmy's saying, okay, I'm not going to get back from this. You've got total control. Um, you know, let's just go to game number three. You have to remember, when you're playing a tournament, you also have to think of time. So um, that also plays a factor in your decision-making here. So it's 1-1, one, one, and that means we're going to get an exciting third game so i'm also curious to see because they're going back to the sideboards again what are they going to take out where are you going to put in and it's, i find this psychological 
um, like sideboarding, I just find that very, very difficult. And I know that some players are really good at it, but I find it like nerve wrecking. So uh, let's uh, give them some time and we'll see them when we start with game number three. Game number three is about to begin. So who's going to win this top eight match? And what a fight it is. Very exciting matchup here. 1-1, one, one, Sven Talk player Jimmy is on play here. Starting good, starting off well here with an Ankh of Mishra. So that's pretty nice. Max Ruby here from Antoine. And what can he do? Ooh, and there's that Ivory Tower again. That kind of was the VIP, in my opinion at least, of game number two. And here he's taking two damage because of the Strip Mine. Stripping here at the Mishra's factory and went really fast there, but that was an ancestral recall played out here by Jimmy. So he's getting back in there as well. And uh, playing out the land, taking two damage and playing an Atok. And the Atok can do some damage here. There's some artifacts on the field, but there's a Swords to Plows here. So there's not much that the Atok uh, can actually do here. Jimmy does get one life at least. Tapping, playing a Disenchant there over the Ivory Tower, obvious choice. Playing a Volcanic Island and taking two more damage there of his own Ankh of Mishra. And there's a Disenchant over the Ankh of Mishra, followed by a Factory. And I actually believe that in this particular uh, situation, Jimmy took more damage from his own Ankh of Mishra. And here we see a Felwer Stone. So this is kind of the cards that you can expect after sideboarding when you're playing against um, against so many Ankh of Mishras. And there's the Big Book. And this is getting dangerous if you're um, Jimmy because you know that the deck plays on card advantage and card advantage is the main strategy. And this book is actually providing that card advantage. Got two blue islands to counter and, and he has a book to draw cards. So he's comfy there in his seat. And can Antoine take the victory here? He's gonna play something. Oh, and this is cool. This is interesting, playing a Karma. Obviously a card that came in from the sideboard. And Karma, at the start of the player's upkeep, it deals one damage per swamp that you control. And as you can see, Jimmy has an underground river. So that underground river is going to deal him one damage every turn. And this is so interesting. It's so spicy. And there's the Abyss. I mean, you don't expect a card like Karma to be played in this particular game. I'm liking it. Very cool, very original. There's a Black Lotus. And let's see what Antoine can do here. He's tapping four. Is he sacking Brain Geyser? Yep, Brain Geyser. Oh, and there's a Red Elemental Blast. A good timing here from Jimmy. Very, very important uh, counter spell here. Because that, that would have given him the match, I'm sure. Um, attack here from the Mishra's factory. Taking the damage, kind of knowing, you know what, if I'm going to block on my own factory, he's probably going to just play a Disenchant or a Swords. And it's interesting to see here. And it went really fast. I believe that was a chain lightning to the face of Antoine. So he's going to 13. But as you can see, Jimmy is also down to 7. So he doesn't have that much life. And remember that Karma's on the field there, dealing at least 1 damage every turn because of the underground sea. And it's just so cool. It's like, it's so unexpected that he plays a Karma. Another Shatter. And another, he removed the land somehow, it was hard to see here, but the Mishra's factory is gone. And that's game! Okay, so the Karma is actually winning the game, wow. Great, great, great magic here, and and I didn't see that Karma. I, di I didn't see it coming. I didn't expect him to board in a Karma, I really, <laughs> I really didn't. And, uh, and kind of winning, I think, I really think the Ivory Towers I uh, really made made an impact here um, on on both of those games after sideboarding, uh, but what a cool way to uh, win a game with with Karma! So really uh, respect here uh, for Antoine's trick. Um, but really, this was a very entertaining match as a whole. So thank you 
uh, both players to Anton and uh, Jimmy. Now, this is the only match of the top eight, unfortunately, that we have of the Knights of Thorn Championship in the Netherlands. I can tell you that Antoine, the player on the left, actually won the tournament. So congratulations, Antoine. Uh, for now, this is our last match from the Knights of Thorn. But if you want to see more old school magic, remember we have an update every Friday and I'm trying to put one or two extra movies during the week on the channel. But every Friday I'll have an upload for you ready to see. For now, you can watch um, the movies that are appearing right now on the screen. If you'd like to see more old school magic, uh, please leave a comment or subscribe to, to help me to help the channel grow. For now, thank you for watching and see you next time. Ik het was fikker te somber gezien.